I want you all to close your eyes and think back to the last thing you made. This could either be a contraption, an application, even a work of art. But close your eyes and think back to the last thing you made by hand. Now, for many of you, it may have been a while. And for some of you, you may have been children the last thing you made something by hand. When I was seven years old, for Christmas, my parents gave me the perennial classic, How Things Work. Inside the book is a set of graphics chronicling the history of invention from the wheel to the basic computer. And to precocious seven-year-old, this is incredible. I could see how everything was made. I could see every machination of every invention in all of human history laid out in a cartoonish and enjoyable format. When I went back home after winter vacation, in my room, I set up my own pulley system. Using little paper cups and strings, I was able to transport food from my door to my bed, which for a lazy seven-year-old on a Saturday morning watching cartoons was an incredible, mind-blowing adventure. <laughs> but it cuts to something a little deeper. There's a group of people out there who believe that what we make is going to have dramatic implications for economics, pop culture, and even human value. This movement is known as the maker movement. And they believe in using raw resources and technologies to create incredible projects and ultimately innovate global solutions. The maker movement ultimately believes that showing is the best form of telling. But to understand the maker movement or how it emerged, we have to first take a detour through history, and specifically economic history. There are three commonly understood ages of economic history, the first of which being the Guild period. We see this during the Middle Ages. Economic transactions are done person to person, with consumers and producers working together to fix everyday woes and needs. While there was a system of merchants that were able to transport goods between towns and villages, that was pretty much the extent of an overriding system of trade. When you get to about the 1500s, we see the beginning of the commercial period. As mercantile activity increases, we see the managers of larger guilds noticing that specialized labor is expensive and untenable. So they proposed two solutions. The first was to streamline the production process, and the second was to break down labor tasks. Now, the first innovation to streamline production processes ensured that as these guilds merged into what we know now as the first corporations, ensured that the ability to scale products at, for 10 customers was scaled efficiently for 10,000 customers. But the second innovation was more interesting. It broke down labor tasks from one long artisan process to easy to digest tasks with a low learning curve. This ensured the introduction of a wide breadth of new labor because the learning curve in order to know new skills was far lower. Now, around the 1800s, we begin to see the emergence of the industrial era. Now, to no one's surprise here, through economic history, the factory was a watershed moment. However, it changed the way that production cycles worked. Human labor was replaced with machine labor. Assembly lines ultimately stripped creative control away from the workers, and innovation was determined from the top down. Here, we see the end of artisan dominance. Now, ultimately, as the global population increased exponentially, we began to see single corporations dominate market sectors. We saw single corporations control everything from cars to toys to bedsheets and produce them on a mass scale to meet everyone's needs. While the quantity of products on the market increased dramatically, the variety of products decreased. Without a space for independent makers and producers to produce their own goods, creativity stalled. The barriers to entry ultimately overcame the desire and ability to innovate. And this really changed the way that we view economics. The way we meet, goods, the way we meet our own needs transitioned from self-production and making it yourself to consumption. And this has shaped the way we look at economics today. We look at consumption, consuming media, and consuming products in order to meet our needs but ultimately, we fail to self-produce anymore. And if we follow down this path, we risk losing our innovative edge, as well as falling prey to unsustainable and relentless consumption. So this leads us on a two-fold path of where we are today, and we see two problem areas that need fixing. The first is in education. Teachers are moving away from science, technology, education, mathematics, and hands-on learning, and students are becoming less interested. In a 2010 survey of high school freshmen, 23% of students indicated they like to go into a STEM field when they grew up. By their senior year, 57% of these students 
decide to change their career path, citing difficulty or disengagement with the subject material. We also see this in the workplace. There are too many employees for too few jobs, as many of us in college understand. And the jobs that are available, a lot of us don't consider meaningful. In a 2013 survey of recent college graduates who are employed, itself a misnomer, as many of us who applied for internships and jobs can attest, 23% of these students said they felt their job was outright meaningless and could be done without them. 55% weren't even working in the field in which they studied in school. So these both point to a larger stigma, however, and that's the stigma around working with our hands. Manufacturing is seen as unglamorous and low paying, and some of our brightest and most innovative students are moving towards careers that are unproductive and ultimately unfulfilling because it's more comfortable. So we see ourselves at a relative fork in the road, which is, do we either continue down this industrialized understanding of the economy and continue working through meaningless jobs, or we enter the next stage of economics, the fourth stage, the maker age. Now, the maker movement believes in flipping this industrialized equation around. It believes that it's the consumer's responsibility to tinker and experiment with the goods that we receive to create eccentric products and show those on a global platform. One of the most hallmark understandings of the maker movement comes from the Homebrew Computer Club. Now, the Homebrew Computer Club was a group of engineers in my hometown of Menlo Park, California, back in 1975. Their engineers used to get together on weekends and exchange circuitry, hardware, and computer parts with what few parts there were for consumer computers back in the 70s. They used to share blueprints, talk, discuss, brag about what cool projects they've created. Well, one day in March of 1975, one of the engineers brought home the Altair 8800. This is the first microcomputer that was available for, con for public consumption in a kit form. It expected you to assemble the computer, create your own innovations with it. And this group was ecstatic. They spent hours, days, weeks tinkering with this computer, pushing it to its limits, ultimately reforming it to computers it wasn't intended to be assembled into. They had it show lights, play music, run small systems for a computer that pretty much only generated binary code. This group wasn't around to vend certain products or create new businesses. It was a group of hobbyists who got together to have fun with computers. However, this group spawned some of the greatest minds in microprocessing and is widely considered the ground zero for the Silicon Valley microprocessing revolution. Innovators such as Steve Wozniak came out of this group. The first Apple I and Apple II computers were modeled based off this original Altair 8800 computer. And it shows something broader about the maker movement. The idea is we can create global invention with what is in front of us. Now, we've had makers before. Leonardo da Vinci used to mess around with steam cannons and flying machines. And even Henry Ford played around with combustion engines before founding Ford Motors. What makes today any different than what we've seen in the past? Well, I argue there are four main reasons that we've seen a new rise in the maker movement as of late. And the first one is the rise in digital communication. Websites like Etsy and Pinterest have allowed makers to push their products onto a platform that's never been seen before. Anybody in their garage can post their own innovation online and have it be seen on a global platform. Crowdfunding has ensured that financial power has been taken away from large exclusive funders and democratized the economic success story. The second has been interest. <clears throat> Those who have seen what the maker movement is capable of have seen the power that it can provide. Back in 2009, at the behest of a friend of mine, I went to my first maker fair. Now, to get an idea of what these fairs are, it resembles a larger science fair come Burning Man. <laughs> thousands of innovators come together to show their projects as well as their artwork to thousands of other curious minds. Having come, not come from an engineering background, but having always been interested in tinkering, I knew I'd be excited, but I didn't know what to expect. When I stepped onto the fairgrounds, I was overwhelmed by the concentration and breadth of interesting people who are making eccentric projects. To me, it was an engineering nirvana, and it overwhelmed me at 14 years old. While to my left, I would see the first ever consumer 3D printer available in the United States. To my right, I would see a car that was entirely covered in pinwheels because the sound is awesome when you're driving down the highway with it. <laughs> the idea behind the maker movement is not making something useful or world-changing. It's the idea of taking what's in front of you and changing it. The third main reason the new maker movement is different is a generational shift. Our parents learned the skills needed to make large economic structures run. They learned management, negotiation, bargaining. 
And while these are important tools for the next generation, the maker movement requires a different context. The maker movement requires room to explore and create their own kind of projects to work on their own. And finally, while our middle-aged brethren taught people to learn a craft and become specialized, the maker movement is teaching us to adapt the resources in front of us. If there's an underlying theme to the maker movement, it's the idea that adaptability is of the highest concern. Taking the tools and resources in front of you, as scant as they are, and making something truly incredible and awesome with it. Now, ultimately, in the spirit of the maker movement, how are we going to adapt to our global future? And I say it starts again in three sectors. First is we have to reshape the way we approach education. We have to remove the stigma around working with our hands and manufacturing and encourage students to pursue creative interests again. We have to ensure that even if you fail or your product doesn't change the world, that's okay because it's the skills you learn and it's the curiosity you nourish that's important to the movement. The second begins in our workplaces. We have to let people use their workplaces for their own work. As most of us can attest, we have busy lives and a lot of that comes from that work-life balance. The idea of companies having a 20% rule where 20% of the day for employees is allowed to be used on pet projects is something that should be encouraged because people ultimately want the freedom to explore their own projects in a safe environment. The, comp the smartest companies of the next generation aren't going to be the ones that are asking where you've worked or what positions you've held. They're going to be the ones that are sitting you down in interviews and asking you what you've made. And third is that the maker revolution is going to be personal. We have to take time out of our own schedules to learn new skills. This could be woodworking, programming, soldering, even painting. But take time out of our lives to build products for ourselves and share them with others for critique and exploration by friends of ours. For those of you who might be wondering why there's a bicycle on stage with me today, this is a bicycle I made two years ago as a junior in high school. It's a scrappy frame that I got handed down from my parents, but everything from the gearing to the wheels to the handlebars and everything except for that shiny blue frame was all handmade and hand sought by me. Because ultimately, there's a feeling of accomplishment and pride that you can get by holding something out in front of you and telling yourself, I made this. So as we all leave today, I encourage you all to nourish that childlike sense of wonder about the world around you. Understand how these complex systems work, because ultimately, the global future is what we make of it. Thank you.